Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In the previous video, we looked at the indications, contraindications, and precautions for mechanical traction of both the cervical and the lumbar spine. This slide is specific for the cervical spine. You can see the traction parameters over here. But let's look more specifically at the major indications for mechanical traction. And all of these go for both the cervical and lumbar spines. The first one is a spinal disc bulge or herniation of the disc, which kind of goes hand in hand to some extent with spinal nerve root impingement, which could cause radicular symptoms. We also have muscle spasm as an indication, subacute joint inflammation. Remember, we're not going to do traction on somebody who's acutely inflamed because that can actually make the inflammation worse. We want to wait until that inflammation calms down and so it's more subacute. And then joint hypomobility. If we have two or more spinal segments that are hypomobile, gapping them with traction creates some space between them and that, that can create some more mobility to bring that mobility up to normal levels. Now these indications tell you very generally what conditions mechanical traction could be used to treat, but these indications leave out two important things. Number one, specific characteristics of the patient that might make traction more beneficial or more successful. Also, it doesn't tell you the probability, any statistics on how successful you might expect the treatment to be. And so for those two things, we go to the more specific clinical prediction rules or CPRs. And so we're gonna be looking at the clinical prediction rules for both cervical mechanical traction and lumbar mechanical traction. Let's start with cervical mechanical traction. So there's five criteria here. The first one is just being at least 55 years old. If you're at least 55 years old, you get a check there, and that's one factor that favors the use of cervical mechanical traction. Fairly simple. The second one is if the person has peripheralization of their signs and symptoms with cervical mobility. So what does that mean? Well, most likely the person will have some neck pain. Okay, but generally that pain is confined to the neck. However, we know that those spinal nerve roots exit those intervertebral foramina and they form nerves that go down the upper extremities, right? And remember, there are certain movements of the neck that can close down or close pack those facet joints, which also close down those intervertebral foramina. And those would be extension of the neck, ipsilateral side bending, and ipsilateral rotation. So in other words, in this patient right here, it appears that he has left radicular symptoms. So for that left spinal nerve root at whatever level we're talking about, if he did extension of the neck, left lateral flexion, and left rotation, those movements would close down that intervertebral foramen, compress it potentially, and cause radicular symptoms. And because his symptoms were originally confined to the neck, but then those movements, in other words, cervical mobility, caused them to peripheralize, to move down the upper extremity, that would be peripheralization. And those signs and symptoms can include pain, which generally is gonna be a shooting, burning, neural type of pain. It could be numbness, it could be any kind of paresthesia. If they have that with cervical mobility, that's gonna get a check right there. The third one is a positive upper limb tension test A. There's multiple upper limb tension tests. We're specifically looking at the one that biases the median nerve. That's the ULTTA. And so if they have a positive test, meaning reproduction of their radicular symptoms or their pain, that's gonna be a check there. The next one is a distraction test, which you see right here. Now the distraction test is an easing test. So when we do this test, we want them to actually start with pain in the neck at baseline, or they can have any of those signs or symptoms that we talked about in the second criterion here going down the upper extremity. And since it's an easing test, if we distract the head, so pull it up, we're pulling those cervical segments apart, and that will help gap the intervertebral foramina, and it should potentially relieve those symptoms. It can relieve the neck pain, or it can relieve the pain going down the arm or whatever paresthesias those are. And if those are relieved with distraction, that would be a positive distraction test. And then we have the shoulder abduction test shown right here. It's not just straight abduction like in a manual muscle test. The patient's gonna actively abduct their shoulder and place the hand on top of the head. That's a true shoulder abduction test. 
If that reproduces the patient's symptoms, particularly in the neck or any peripheralization type of symptoms, into the upper extremity that we talked about, that's going to be a positive shoulder abduction test. And so those are our five criteria. Now, depending on how many of these are positive, we can predict how successful cervical mechanical traction will be as a treatment. If three out of five of these are positive, any three, doesn't matter which ones, the likelihood that the cervical traction will be beneficial to the patient is 79.2%, almost 80. That's pretty good, roughly four out of five patients. If four out of five of these are checked or positive, doesn't matter which ones, then there's a 94.8, almost 95% success rate for cervical mechanical traction. And if all five are positive, checks, virtually 100% success rate. Okay? So if you decide that your patient needs cervical mechanical traction, then you can, of course, progress to using it. And remember from the previous video, we're going to have the patient in supine generally. And we don't just have the back of the head at rest on the table here with the neck in neutral. We're actually going to have about 20 to 30 degrees of cervical flexion. And the reason that we do that is because if we had the neck in neutral and distracted it with traction device like this, we're going to get some separation. But we can actually maximize the intervertebral separation and gap them better uh, when there's a little bit of cervical flexion. Okay? So that is cervical mechanical traction. We also have mechanical lumbar traction. You can see these parameters over here, and overall they're a lot larger than they were for the cervical spine. And that's because the lumbar spine is a little bit larger, quite a bit larger actually, and it's more stable. And so it's going to require a lot more force in order to gap those vertebral segments apart. Okay? And overall, the indications, contraindications, and precautions are the same. However, remember for indications, it doesn't give you any probability of success, and it also doesn't tell you any specific characteristics of the patient that might make the treatment more successful. To be more specific, we have to look at the lumbar mechanical traction, CPR. That's what we're going to do right now. So there's four criteria here. The first one is being at least 30 years old. So notice for cervical traction, it's at least 55. For lumbar traction, it's at least 30. So a lot broader patient distribution there. Also having a non-manual work job status. When they made this clinical prediction rule, one of the questions they asked the people was, do you have manual work or non-manual work? Meaning, do you work at something like building homes, something that you do a lot of physical labor with, versus sitting at a desk? Okay. And so things like sitting at a desk where you're not doing as much physical, not as much of a physically demanding job, that would be non-manual work. And so being in a non-manual occupation is one factor that favors lumbar traction. Okay. It turns out that being in a manual type of work, very heavy physical labor, actually disfavors lumbar mechanical traction. Okay. And that comes from the study that determined this CPR. The third criterion here is having no neurological deficit, a negative neuro screen or negative neuro exam. That might seem counterintuitive, but based on the data that developed this lumbar traction CPR, having no neurological deficit makes it more likely that mechanical traction will help. So diminished sensation via dermatomes, weakness via myotomes, hyporeflexia for the DTRs, um, and any kind of paresthesias, those disfavor lumbar mechanical traction. And then finally, we have the FABQ, W, that is the Fear Avoidance Beliefs Questionnaire, and specifically the work part. Remember, the Fear Avoidance Beliefs Questionnaire has two components. The first one up here is the shorter part. That's the physical activity component. And then the second part here is the work component. It's a little bit longer. And we want the FABQW to be less than 21. And if it's less than 21, that favors mechanical traction of the lumbar spine. And the general rule here is that if any three out of four of these are checks or positive, then that's going to give an 80% success rate for using lumbar mechanical traction to treat the person's low back pain. And assuming that you've got three out of four or even four out of four that are positive, then we can proceed to actually doing the lumbar mechanical traction. Now, as opposed to cervical traction, which is done primarily in supine, uh, this can actually be done in supine or prone. Now, the supine mechanical traction is going to get better opening of the neural foramen, which is going to relieve that pressure or compression on the nerve roots. But wait, 
I thought that having no neurological deficit favored lumbar mechanical traction. That's true. This is in the CPR. Okay, That just came out of patient data and who was successful. But you can use traction if there's spinal nerve root impingement. Okay, Just because it doesn't satisfy the CPR doesn't mean you can't use mechanical traction. Maybe some patients would be successful uh, with mechanical traction for relieving that compression of the nerve roots. Okay, uh, You also get better zygopophyse or facet joint traction. And this is also a good position to reduce disc lesions. So that's your supine. But there's also prone. Now, the prone position is the best position to reduce disc lesions. So if you're trying to reduce a disc lesion, it's prone. If you're looking for opening of the neural foramen and the facet joints, that's better in supine. Okay? Uh, for the prone position, this possibly is going to be uncomfortable in the older patients, the geriatric population, and anyone with spinal extension or hip extension limitations. So if somebody has really tight hip flexors, or if they have something like lumbar spinal stenosis where they don't tolerate extension very well, then prone's not going to be the best option. You might have to use supine if this is going to be your treatment. Okay. Um, again, you can still achieve benefits via supine. You can still reduce disc lesions, maybe not as much as prone, but supine is still a valid option there. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the cervical and lumbar mechanical traction clinical prediction rules. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.